The title of this message this morning is Timing Means Everything. Timing means everything. And I think we are living, the church, the body of Christ, us as individual disciples of Jesus, we are living in a time, in a season, where the timing is crucial to understand. So much so that what was done and said 30, 40 years ago really was for 30, 40 years ago and really doesn't matter for now. That was 30, 40 years ago. What, what the timing that we live in today is so much closer to the coming of the Lord than even 10 years ago, just a few years ago, that timing, as time gets narrower and narrower to the coming of the Lord, the understanding of timing shrinks and becomes more and more important. More and more important. Amen. When 40 years ago it was like this, today I believe it's like this. Yep. Amen. So that's what I want to talk to us about here this morning, is the concept, the notion of timing. First of all, turn your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 15. <clears throat> I'm going to read a verse here that Solomon talks about timing. I'm not going to preach and give us good advice this morning because I, I don't, I'm not a good advice preacher. I'm a truth preacher. But Paul here in Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 23, he says this, A man hath joy by the answer of his mouth, and a word spoken in due season, how good is it? And a word spoken in due season. That means the timing of that word was perfect. And how good was that? You ever been in a place where you just kind of needed a compliment from somebody? And you got that compliment and it just, you just, man, it just, yeah. It just made you feel so much better. Or an answer to prayer or something happened. You know, something good, and you, you just were in a place, in a season where that, you know, maybe you're struggling just a little bit, and, and some word was spoken that absolutely touched and ministered to you right in, in the middle of your soul where it needed to be. Yes, amen. And then Solomon says, how good is it? Now, that's a whole nother sermon. We could write a book on that, right? And preachers have. They've written a book on that. I don't need to write a book on it. And I don't need to expound any more on it than that in, in the realm of good advice. But, but just to say this in closing of that scripture. You know, husbands and wives. How crucial is it? How important is it that we tell our spouses on a regular basis how much we love them? Amen. And we tell them that we love them. We remind them that we love them. You know, in the old adage, I told her I loved her when I married her. If I change my mind, I'll let her know. You know what? If a Christian man ever says that to himself, I would dare say he, he ain't going to heaven. He has no idea who Jesus is. He has no idea of Calvary. He has no idea of the love of God. And that's just a bunch of garbage. Can you say amen? You see, and so husbands and wives, on a regular basis, we need to share every day. Just tell our spouses how much we love them. Amen. I'm just not that kind of guy. Well, you know what? Get over yourself. <laughs> Become that kind of guy. Amen. Honey, this is hard for me to say, but the pastor told me to say it, so I just love you. Okay. Well, that, you know, <laughs> tone of voice, that may have something to do with it. The circumstance, oh yeah, by the way, I love you. I just want to let you know that. You know, that... Timing is everything. Now let me just take here for a moment. Now let me expand. Because I've spent a lifetime studying, researching qualities and characteristics of famous people that made them the greatest. Whatever it might be. The best of all time, the greatest of all time. And I've spent my life studying them because I've, I've always wanted to be the very best that I could be. And that's the one thing that all of those men and women have in common 
is that they all had a drive within themselves, a competitive drive to be the best that they could be. And it didn't matter so much what was going on around them as what was going on in their own lives. And that competitive drive drove them to be the best that they could be. Now, not everybody is going to best be the best in the world at this or that, at business, sports, whatever. That, that's not the point. The point is to dissect and, and gravitate towards and mine out that notion or that concept when the Bible says, for he is holy, be ye holy. And where the scripture says, he is perfect, so be ye be perfect. You know, and then, well, we'll never be perfect. Nobody's ever going to be perfect. <coughs> Shut up. He is perfect, therefore be perfect. That means that we're to listen to what this preacher has to say because it's important to God that we be the best disciples of Christ possible. Okay. <clears throat> I've studied almost my whole life guys like Jack Nicholas, Tiger Woods, you know, they're golfers and stuff. And, and Jack Nicholas is the greatest golfer of all time. But his statistics, his statistics are just above average with all the other golfers over time. How far he hits the ball, how many birdies he made. Uh, how well he putted, his putting statistics, his short game, what we call around the greens. It, actually, his short game was a below average, below average, and he'll even admit that, that he, his short game could have been a lot better. But he's the greatest of all time. And when I listen to Jack Nicholas talk, and whenever he's talking at any time, I always block everything else out, and I want to listen to what he has to say, because he's the greatest, and so I want to, whatever he has to say is pretty important. And whenever I listen to what he has to say, very seldom am I intrigued by what he has to say. It's just like, well, other than he had a driving, competitive nature about him to be the best that he could, there's no other diadem, there's no other secret or, or magic bullet that anybody can can use or add to them or buy or put on or whatever that can make them a lot better than what they are. And so over all the years, I listened to Jack Lincoln's. And you know what makes him the greatest of all times? And here's the premise of this whole message. He was able to do what he did when it mattered most. And he did that better than any other golfers ever. He was able to do <clears throat> what he did, <clears throat> excuse me, what he did when it mattered most. The reason Tiger Woods is so famous is because in his generation of golfers, he could do what he did when it mattered most. When he had to hit this four foot putt, he could do it when everybody else couldn't do it. When he had to hit a drive straight down the middle, he had to drive straight down the middle where everybody else was right and left. He could do what he did when it mattered most. You see the scripture that we just read from Solomon, a word that is spoken in due season. How good is it? A word that is spoken when it matters most. Oh, how good it is. And that's what I want us to understand concerning the signs of the times, folks, in which we live. Now, we all know Michael Jordan. You know his name in basketball. Many consider him the greatest all of all time. His statistics are above average, but nowhere are they the best. Shooting percentages, foul shots, you know, fouls how many points he averaged per game. Now when it goes to how many points did he average during the playoffs, he goes clear up here. And then when you say how many championships did he win compared to everybody else, he's next to the top. Bill Russell is the greatest of all time. He won 11 world championships. 
And both Bill Russell and Michael Jordan, if there's anything that they say other than their competitive drive, was that because it was a team sport for them, what helped them succeed was that they helped make everybody else around them better. As disciples of Christ, we're responsible to make everybody else around us better. You need to pray for me so I'll be better. I need to pray for you and help you so you'll be better. We need to pray for one another so that we'll grow in the things of God. Say amen. You see, and that's what elevates someone to greatest of all time. That's what's going to elevate us to mansions just over the hilltop. Treasures in heaven is we embrace when we embrace this concept and this notion that what we do, when we do it, when it matters most, that has the greatest impact. If we look at other great people, great athletes, and so forth, we can see that what they did, basically all their statistics, Mickey Mantle and all those teams of, of the Yankees in the, in the 50s and the early 60s, you know, now they have great statistics. But what made them the greatest of all time was that they could do it when it mattered the most. You know, Tom Brady, I know there might even be some of you listening to this. You're a Tom Brady hater. And all I have to say to you is you're going to go to hell. That's, that's, what I, that's my answer for that. And Tom Brady, if, if, if you just think back about the last two Super Bowls that Tom Brady won, they were incredible Super Bowls. And he did better than any other quarterback previous to him in those two Super Bowls. When? When it mattered the most. This last drive, he's got to complete this pass. He has to, you know, he has to lead his team down the field when it mattered the most. That's why Brady. Now, if you stop and look at him, and then I'll move on, to solidify what I'm saying is the fact that last year he went to the Buccaneers and won the Super Bowl again for the first year. Nobody in the history of sports has ever done that before. That's right. And you listen to Tom Brady, and basically his whole mantra is he has a, a, a famous diet, and he works harder than anybody else, and all these, he has a drive, a competitive drive. He's always competed with a chip on his shoulder and so forth. But folks, so does a lot of other athletes, football players. But what makes him the greatest of all time is that he could do it when it mattered the most. And we've all seen that come to pass. Whether you like it or not, it's a truth and a reality. That's why he is the greatest of all time. Now let's move to some scripture for a moment. Let's look at Peter just for a second. I consider myself an expert in Peter. In fact, I'm reading this book and this brother that wrote this book referenced Peter and, and how that he, uh, when he... Uh, uh, betrayed Christ and he called Peter a coward and all those type of things and he, he said the things that he said because he doesn't know Peter like I know Peter and I just totally disagreed with him and I, I told Linda I said see and I, and I read to her what he said and I said see he's saying this because he doesn't know and understand the Essene the Essene philosophy that was taking place at that time and I believe I know that John the Baptist bought into the Essene philosophy. And the Essene philosophy was that this great being was going to come out of heaven, was going to put together an army, was going to defeat the Romans, defeat evil, would set up his kingdom on earth, and righteousness would rule forever. And the Jews were going to be a major part of that. And these guys bought into that. But see, this guy who wrote this book thing, he, didn't have, he has no idea about that. And so he said things that are really not true. And I disagree with him. And I said that because he doesn't, understand, he doesn't have the knowledge or to understand. But So I say that to say I, I think I know Peter just about as well as anybody or as well as I could know anybody from the Bible. And let's look at Peter for a second. And there's a lot of, the, you know, a lot of people aren't sure that Peter ever really figured it out. That Jesus Christ didn't come just for the Jews. Now Peter never really figured it out that, you know, well, okay, you know, maybe you don't need to be circumcised, but I'm pretty sure you probably do to be saved. You know what I'm saying? 
Okay, I, you, maybe you don't have, you know, you can eat that kind of meat, but I'm, I'm pretty certain you probably shouldn't eat that meat, otherwise you're not going to be saved, you know. And a lot of people think that maybe Peter was like that. And, and for years I kind of agreed with that until I come to understand the concept and the notion of what matters most. And so you have to look at the very last act of Peter's life to understand him completely where he came. And when it mattered the most in Peter's life to when he was going to be put to death and he told his Roman soldiers, his accusers, turn me upside down. I am not worthy to be crucified even as my Lord. I must be turned upside down. That act was when it mattered the most and that says Peter got it. Amen. That says Peter got it. If he had not have done that, then we could all say, well, you know, I don't know. But when Peter did that, he got it. And he knew that all could be saved under the grace of Jesus Christ. Say amen. amen. Let me talk now just for a moment. One more example before I close. And I want to talk about the, the ten virgins. We know the parable of the ten virgins. Oh, shoot. I forgot. Oh, I could get it. Um, ah. <clears throat> I was going to get my five-gallon gas can to use as a visual. And it's just right in there, but that's okay. All right, so the soundman comes and says, Hey! Fill your lamps with oil because the master's coming back for the bride sometime tonight. So the ten virgins, they all fill up their lamps with oil. Now listen, folks. Filling up their lamps with oil when they heard the announcement at noontime didn't really mean a thing. It didn't really mean a thing. And as the day went on, and as they were preparing themselves to meet the master, as long as there's daylight, whether they have enough oil or not enough oil, really isn't important. Because if the master comes back while it's daylight, they didn't need the lamps in the first place. So you see, it's not time yet for when it mattered the most. And so then comes darkness. The sun sets at 5.30. 5.30 the sun sets, but you still have about a half an hour, whether you can still kind of see. So around 6 o'clock, it's now pitch black. And the ten virgins turn on their lamps. Probably pretty important that you have oil right now. Probably pretty important. But look at it. Folks, think about this now. The longer that it stays dark, the more important to have extra oil becomes important. Mm -hmm. You see, these are the signs of the times. We live in the last second of the times of mankind. And we still have preachers and churches and Christians that are completely obtuse about what's going on in the world. I don't even think they know what's going on in the world. And I don't mean to be critical, but you'll know it by what they say and by what they don't say, by what they do and by what they don't do. And as long as they had oil in the lamps, that was fine. But the longer it stayed dark, the more important now it become that they have extra oil. Hallelujah. And then when it mattered the most, when it mattered the most, those five who did not for all the reasons 
truths that I preached on before months ago that I'm not going to take time now to once again illustrate for all of those reasons when it mattered the most. They ran out of oil. And the master came back and the five who prepared themselves and understood that they must be ready for the time will come when it will matter the most and they will be ready to perform it. They met the master and the other five yeah. went to hell. Yes, yeah. They even borrow, ask, can we buy some? No can do. Can we borrow some? No can do. And those who had plenty in their lamps said this, you know what? You should have thought about that a long time ago. When your preacher preached to you that when it mattered the most, you needed extra oil, and you don't have extra oil, so get lost. They go running back for oil, but it's too late. The master has come. You see, folks, the scripture tells us that the Lord is going to come as a thief in the night, that nobody knows when that might be. Let me tell you something. The longer it goes that the Lord, the Father, hesitates to send his son back for the church, the longer that waits, the more important the next day is to be ready and to have more oil in your lamp. Because Christ, listen, who's the Lord talking about? I mean, folks, the world has absolutely come undone. Fish are dying in the ocean. They blame it on climate change. The earth is burning up, the northwest, hottest June ever in history. Blame it on climate change. There's storms in New York and they're for blaming on climate change. You know, something else happened over here, blame it on racism. Something else crazy going on with it. You know, they're teaching our little children about critical race theory. They're indoctrinating our children. Are you kidding me? Are you serious? Our education has fallen apart. Why? The institutions. One of the reasons is this. January 20th, 2009, our newly elected president stood up and to the whole world within the first two minutes of his inaugural address declared that America is no longer a Christian nation. And when I heard him say that, I got chills all over me. And I just, oh man, are we in trouble now. You cannot do that. You cannot do that. Yeah. My point being is this, not that we look back, because you know what, that was then. And if the Lord doesn't come today, tomorrow is more important than today. It's going to matter more tomorrow than today matters. Because we're getting closer to the coming of the Lord. Now, in closing, let us make application of all of this revelation, this understanding of how important it is to do what we do when it matters most. See, a year and a half ago, my family, and especially me, I was challenged to do something that I did, that when I accomplished that task, when I did what I've done almost my whole life was preach the gospel. But this was a setting that no preacher would ever advocate for having to preach this message. And I declare that if I can stand up in front of these 600 people and speak and do what I know I've always done, what I'm called to do, and now what I have to say might even be, might even upset some people, 
might even, many people might even completely disagree or denounce, but yet I'm going to speak it because it came from God and God showed me if I can do this, I can do anything because right now this matters the most. wish that upon nobody. But since the Lord brought it to me, I'm speaking it to you. And speaking it to you. The reason they're the greatest of all time is because they did what they did when it mattered the most. Can we worship God when we don't feel like worshiping God? Can we pray when we feel like we're all praying? Can we pray when we feel like God's not hearing or answering any more of my prayers? Can we minister to somebody when we need somebody to minister to us? You see, folks, that's when it matters the most. And if we're able to pull that trigger, if we're able to hit that pot, if we're able to shoot and make that basket, we have enough oil in our lamps. Can you say amen? amen? Let's all stand. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, I just pray now your blessing upon this congregation and all those that are watching this, Lord, on our website. That we embrace the spiritual reality and truth of the importance of understanding when it matters the most. And right now, our walk with you and our looking into the heavens for you matters the most, more than ever before, more than yesterday. God, I pray your anointing now upon this congregation, Lord, as we all go our separate ways, that you anoint us in our relationships, that you touch our bodies in health and in spirit. That you minister and you expand, Lord, our finances. That you touch our lives in ways, Lord, that matter the most. That we might be true disciples of you, Lord. Hallelujah. That we be the true church ready to meet the master in the air. Hallelujah. Now bless this congregation and everyone who's watching this on our website. God, I pray your anointing, your blessing upon their lives. And I give you praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. amen.